Warning, the following video contains disturbing material that may be inappropriate for younger viewers. Parental discretion is advised. When Juan Corona was convicted of 25 murders in January 1973, he entered the history books as one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history. Since then, however, his grisly record has been overtaken, and Corona's name has become nearly as obscure as the man himself who is suffering from dementia. Juan Corona was born in Mexico in 1934. Like many thousands of his compradors, he moved north to California to find work in the 1950s. Compared to most of his fellow Mexican immigrants, he did well. Over the years, he put down roots, married and had four children, established his own farm in Yaba City, just outside of Sacramento in Northern California. He specialized in providing labor for other farmers and ranchers in the area. In effect, he acted as a middleman between the new generations of desperate immigrants, legal and illegal, looking for work in the field and their potential employers. The immigrants would wait in lines in the early morning and Corona would show up in a truck and offer work. It was a hard but settled life and it was only briefly disturbed when in 1970 there was a violent incident in a cafe owned by Corona's brother, Natividad. A young Mexican was savage with a machete. The young man accused Natividad of being the attacker. Natividad promptly fled back to Mexico and the case was soon forgotten. That is until the following year when in May 19, 1971, one of Juan Corona's neighbors, a Japanese-American farmer who had hired some workers from Corona, noticed a hole that has been dug in his land. Suspicious, he asked the police to investigate. On excavating the hole, they found a body, which proved to be that of a drifter called Kenneth Whitaker. Whitaker had been stabbed in the chest and head, almost splitting the body in two, by blows from a machete or similar carving instrument. Gay literature was found on the body, leading the police to suspect a sexual motive. Four days later, workers in a nearby ranch discovered a second body, a drifter called Charles Fleming. At this point, the police started searching the area. Over the next nine days, they would discover a total of 25 bodies, mostly in an orchard on Corona's land. They had all been killed by knives or machetes following the same pattern, a deep stab wound to the chest and two gashes across the back of the head in the shape of a cross. Furthermore, the bodies were all buried face up with their arms above their heads and their shirts over their faces in some but not all cases of recent homosexual activity. What was overwhelming was not just the number of victims, that none of the bodies had been in the ground longer than six weeks. Whoever had killed them had been in the mindset of an extraordinary orgy of murder, killing at the rate of more than one every two days. None of the dead had been reported as missing. Four of the 25 were never identified at all. The rest were immigrant workers, drifters, and skid row bums. Whoever had selected these for murder had clearly been a good judge of people at the bottom of the heap, well able to identify those that had fallen through the safety net. The police quickly came up with a suspect, Juan Corona. To start off with, all the bodies were buried on or near Corona's land. Secondly, two victims had bank receipts with Juan Corona's name on them in their pockets. It was no more than circumstantial evidence, but the extraordinary scale of the crimes was enough to persuade the police to proceed. When Juan Corona was duly arrested and charged with the murders, his defense team tried to pin the blame on his brother, Natividad, who had a history of violence but failed to prove that Natividad was even in the country at the time. Overall, Corona's defense was spectacularly incompetent. At the trial, they failed to mention that Juan was diagnosed as a schizophrenic in 1956, which prevented them from mounting a defense of insanity. Even so, the lack of direct evidence meant that the jury deliberated for 45 hours before finding Corona guilty. He was sentenced to 25 terms of life imprisonment, the death penalty not being available in California at the time. Juan Corona continued to protest his innocence and was allowed a retrial in 1978 on the grounds that his previous defense had been incompetent. Even with a competent defense, however, Corona was again found guilty. While in prison, he was the victim of a serious attack by a fellow inmate in which he lost an eye. He was held in a state prison along with Charles Manson. However, while Manson remains the focus of gruesome cult following, Corona is largely ignored and was seen mumbling to himself in the prison courtyard, like his victims, another forgotten man. Juan Corona would spend the rest of his days locked up in the California State Prison until the day of his death on March 4th, 2019. He died of natural causes. 
Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I really hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment who you think the next serial killer is going to be. And also remember to comment down below anything having to do with the video for a chance to be on a daily shout out. You can also follow me or reach out to me on Twitter and I have a Twitch channel that I play some games on. Both will be linked in the description down below. Until next time guys, sweet dreams.